There we go. Can people hear me now? Um, I'd like to thank you for coming to the second session of our open class. I'd like to thank you for coming to our second session of the open classroom. When we scheduled this, I kind of thought of this as being, oh, it's about the courts, it's kind of dull, but it's important. And um, little did we know that it would, of course, be right at the center of like, this incredible controversy going on now um, around the Kavanaugh nomination. Um, what we are going to do, even though I know people can talk for hours about uh, the Kavanaugh uh, controversy, is we're going to spend the first part um, talking about the courts because Trump and the courts and the role of the courts in uh, addressing a lot of the key issues facing the country right now, um, I think we all agree is very important. And we have um, Professor Woody Hartzog with us, um, who is a First Amendment and privacy expert and has thought and written a lot about these issues. And so in Trump's world and the world we're living in, the media world we're living in, obviously every story gets 30 seconds and then we move on to the next one. But this is one case in which I'd like us to start kind of going deep on this question of why the courts matter and, and the battle that's going on over the courts, and then we will allow um, a good hour or more um, to talk about the issues raised by the Kavanaugh hearing about Anita Hill. Um, for those of you of a certain age, you would be uh, depressed or happy or not surprised to know that, uh, as one of my students pointed out in the class, none of the students were born when Anita Hill first testified. Um, so uh, for this, I think it's an education for them, as well as maybe uh, reliving it uh, for, uh, for some of us. Um, Next week, uh, just to mark in your calendar, is going to be another non-controversial topic, which is the crisis in the Catholic Church. Um, it's going to be led um, with Walter Robinson, um, who was the head of the Spotlight team and um, led the investigation of the priest abuse scandal, which broke all this open. Uh, joined by Matt Carroll, um, both of them now teach at Northeastern, and um, they have been kind of at the forefront of this. Uh, the movie, uh, obviously, um, Spotlight was based on their work. Um, they will talk a little bit about what it's like to be portrayed by uh, actors like Michael Keaton, if you like. Um, but they are also going to talk about the role of investigative journalism, its importance. Um, so this is something that um, I think will be really interesting. If you want to let other people know about it, people who you know who might be interested, both in the investigative journalism part, but also the, the, uh, the crisis facing the church, um, please feel free to invite me. Um, uh, as we are, oh, and then finally, on a religious note, um, those of you may realize or may know, today is that it's the, right now is the end of Yom Kippur, which is the Jewish Day of Atonement when Jews apologize for their sins. And Jews have a tradition which is you apologize for your sins in the synagogue to God, but if you offended people personally, you have to apologize to them. I personally want to make atonement to say that we are going to be talking about the Kavanaugh hearings in Anita Hill with an all male panel. Um, which was not our intention. Um, this obviously has all broken in the past couple of days. Uh, both Woody Hartzog and I worked very hard um, to try to get uh, some women to join us on the panel. We were unsuccessful, but not because we're stupid. Um, we, we understand the issues. Um, and I do feel that I'm sure many of you will have um, things you want to say. And certainly in our class discussion that preceded this, um, a number of the undergraduates um, made, I thought, really important points, and I'll be encouraging them to speak up as well. So um, please don't do that. Please don't tweet a picture of the panel and kind of bash on some <laughs> hashtag clues. Because we get um, okay, I just wanted to start <clears throat> with a, a brief video about this broad question of the courts and the stakes and why, even before the allegations came out um, about Kavanaugh, um, this... Um, this uh, uh, nomination was, was so controversial and seen as so uh, consequential. A federal judge, a federal judge, a federal judge ruled in favor of the administration. A federal judge has now blocked the third version of President Trump's travel ban. With gridlock in Congress and President Trump in the White House, the power of the U.S. courts is becoming increasingly apparent and politicized. Republicans have a prime opportunity to leave their mark on the nation's world. It's always been that Republicans, for some reason, care more about the courts than Democrats do. Supreme Court justices. And Donald Trump really capitalized on that in this past election. More than a quarter of Trump voters said the Supreme Court was the most important issue to them. With that momentum behind him, 
Trump entered the White House with 108 vacancies for federal judges with life terms. That's one-eighth of the nation's 870 federal judges, more than any president since Bill Clinton. President Obama faced a Republican Senate in his last two years, and those Republicans really blocked his nominees. That left a lot of openings to be filled right away, at almost historic levels. The Senate continues our work to confirm President Trump's well-qualified judicial nominees. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has made courts one of his priorities. This is my top priority, so as soon as they come out of committee, I have a choice between taking up a particular bill or taking up a certain court judge. I take up a certain court judge because I think it makes the longest lasting contribution to making this the kind of country it, it, it ought to be. As older judges continue to retire, Trump has handed more vacancies. 18 months in, 145 vacancies waited to be filled. Trump had nominated 137 federal judges at that point. Only 43 of them were appointed by the Senate, but that's on par with past presidents. And by the end of Trump's term in 2020, more than half of all lifetime judges will be eligible for retirement. Over 99% of the cases are decided at the lower federal courts, and so it's really important to have judges at those levels who are going to be faithful to the law. One relatively recent phenomenon is the role of outside groups in starting almost campaigns for these Supreme Court nominees, and even for some of the lower court nominees. Tell me, Senator, confirm Kavanaugh, put Kyle Duncan on the Fifth Circuit. They are spending millions of dollars on both sides. The truth comes out. The number of groups engaged in fighting the Trump administration's court packing scheme uh, has grown, hugely grown. Our role, really, from my perspective, is from the outside to be able to defend some of those nominees and correct some of the mis misconceptions, the distortions of your record. And we've seen that as, the, as the politicization of the process has ramped up, that happening more and more. The number of Trump's appeals court appointments in particular stands out. He's appointed far more judges to the Circuit Courts of Appeals than any recent president at this point in their term. Appeals courts are important because they cover multi-state regions, and so whatever those courts decide becomes precedent in that region. Like all federal judges, they serve for a life. And the Trump administration has really looked for younger judges. A lot of the judges that they've put on the appeals courts will serve for decades. The bulk of our current federal judges were appointed by President Obama, but some who were appointed by Gerald Ford and Lyndon B. Johnson are still on the bench. Politicizing judicial appointments doesn't start or end with Trump but his appointees could chart the nation's course for generations to come. I was seven at the time when I was diagnosed. I definitely felt like giving up. Fighting cancer and using it. So I just wanted to pick up briefly on that last point that politicizing the court uh, doesn't uh, begin with Trump and that we heard the term court packing, which of course goes back to uh, Franklin Roosevelt when Franklin Roosevelt um, tried to expand the Supreme Court because he felt that they were blocking um, his, uh, a lot of his New Deal programs, and that created a huge controversy and a huge defeat for Roosevelt um, at the hands of the Congress that refused to go along. One of the things that I think is interesting now, and, and uh, Woody Hartzog may talk about this, as we become more polarized as a country, as there's this increasing deadlock between Congress and the President, between parties and Congress, more and more decisions are ending up in the courts. We see that just recently with uh, questions about the travel ban, questions about DACA, you know, over and over again, the courts are being asked to decide these issues. And one of the things that I think is interesting here is we're seeing a growing loss of confidence in American institutions across the board, um, in the media, in education, in government, in corporations. Um, the Supreme Court has always, I think, been seen as somewhat of a neutral arbiter, even though I suspect history will tell us that's not true. And there have been many cases in the past when it was over desegregation or civil liberties, um, Bush versus Gore, that the country was deeply divided over Supreme Court decisions. Um, I just wanted to share a few charts with you um, that uh, speak to this question of can the court maintain kind of its support uh, in, in, in America if it in fact becomes more polarized. Um, here you see that um, the uh, approval of the Supreme Court um, as an institution, the 
way it does its job, um, was, you know, it's 62% as recently as 2002. Now, again, this was after Bush versus Gore. It was after controversial decisions about affirmative action. Um, you know, this was not a time when everybody was kind of holding hands and saying kumbaya. There had been lots of fights and battles in the Supreme Court. But still, 62% of the country um, felt that, that the court was doing a, a good job. Um, that's now dropped to 41%, um, which, um, you know, which uh, was in 2016. Um, it's, it's ticked up a little bit more recently, um, but given the polarization that we're seeing um, in the country, um, there's, there's some concern, I think, that this might continue. Now, that's important, I think, because compared to every other government institution, the Supreme Court is lionized. Um, you know, congressional approval, how do you think Congress is doing, is uh, down around below 20%. Uh, Trump's approval, as we know, um, continues to fall. It's now below 40%. And not sparing the media, um, the negative views of the media are increasing. And while the media is above Congress, it's still pretty low uh, in terms of what, um, what, uh, what institutions you trust. So I, I think there's sort of two questions here. One is, what is the role of the court going to be going forward? And why is it important? And then are we going to be entering a, a new phase where the court now becomes something that people uh, become polarized about, uh, perhaps not respect as much, and what some of the consequences of that might be if citizens feel that the court doesn't speak for them and isn't acting as uh, some kind of an honest broker. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite Ted Landmark to join us and Professor Woody Hartsock from the Northeastern Law School. Um, Woody has been at the law school a couple of years now. Um, He's uh, from the South, as you'll be able to tell from his accent. Um, he's a very well-known expert on privacy and First Amendment law. Um, and um, is somebody who has a real gift for understanding how kind of everyday issues uh, intersect with, uh, with the legal world and with the courts. So I'm going to kind of ask him questions, and then we'll give all of you a chance to do it before we swing into, uh, into the, uh, the capital controversy. Uh, Zach? So this is Ted Landsmark, who's head of the Dukakis Center, and our host here. And Woody so Woody, can I ask you to put on your law professor hat for a few minutes and talk a little bit about you know why the courts matter and whether they matter now more than maybe 15 or 20 years ago? Sure. So uh, it's great to see everybody. The, the, the courts, and this is a question that I get sometimes, which is why is it such a big deal? Why does it matter who is on the Supreme Court? And it, it, the, the simplest explanation is probably that it matters for two main reasons. One is the authority that courts have, federal courts mainly, specifically the Supreme Court, just the, and of course, specifically listed in the Constitution, has on uh, law in America. Uh, and so there's a supremacy that the Supreme Court has. It's, it's literally baked into the name. It is the Supreme Court. Um, and what I mean by that is that they get the final word on certain sorts of disputes, particularly involving the Constitution, which of course is our rights. And so whenever there's a challenge about the way that the Constitution comes out, we ultimately have made a sort of collective decision, which started with a decision based by the Supreme Court in the first place, to let the Supreme Court be the arbiter of that. And so many rights that we come to associate with being fundamentally American rights, um, sexual uh, freedom of choice, for example, uh, the First Amendment, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, uh, the rights to uh, be, uh, uh, the Fourth Amendment rights, uh, to be free from privacy, a lot of due process rights, and the sort of the list goes on and on, the right against self-incrimination keeps going. All of these rights are interpreted ultimately by the Supreme Court. Um, and, and so we should care because of the power that is, that is vested within them. They also uh, interpret lots of challenges to the way in which the government is structured. So the way in, in law schools, for example, the way in which we talk about the Constitution, which 
tends to be sort of a vague concept, can actually be broken down in two different ways. Um, one of them is, is, is a structural document. It lays out the branches of the government. Uh, the Constitution lays out that we have an executive branch, and we have a judicial branch, and then we have a legislative branch, right? And, and they sort of uh, divvies up who sort of calls uh, what rules and who creates what rules. And so the Constitution does that, and it enumerates the powers of all of those branches. Um, that becomes important when any one of the branches uh, gets near the gray area of what we think might be the limits of, for example, legislative authority or executive authority. Uh, the other reason is that it articulates our rights. And the, and the second reason that the Supreme Court matters so much is because of the inherent ambiguity that exists in all of our laws, but particularly the rights as they're articulated in the Constitution. Let's take a brief example to explain what I mean by this. Take the First Amendment. The common uh, the part of the First Amendment that many people know is that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Right? This is what we all know sort of as the genesis of the, the freedom of speech within the United States. But baked into that uh, is an incredible amount of ambiguity. The, the first word alone has already come to mean something that we don't that we don't necessarily mean, which is Congress. Do we mean just Congress? Do we mean U.S. Congress? Do we mean state Congress? The Supreme Court has interpreted that to actually mean all government action. Now, how do we get to that? We interpret it. Right? There's a series of sort of documents that, and, and, and logical uh, reasoning that the Supreme Court went through to justify that. Congress shall make no law. Well, now that seems pretty direct. No law. But then immediately it comes into conflict with a number of different existing laws that are actually provided for in the Constitution. Another really good example would be copyright law. Copyright law is a law that gives people power over particular words, for example, right? It protects creative expression. Copyright law, if you've ever written a, a short story or a book, copyright law protects that. So, if you think about it, copyright law is a law that abridges other people's freedom of speech because it allows copyright owners to say, you can't say that in that particular way. That's literally what we allow copyright to do. So all of a sudden, we've got an internal conflict. Is no law, literally no law, meaning that the First Amendment now wipes out the copyright clause of the Constitution? Or do we interpret it right, to mean uh, we have a strong scrutiny on these sorts of laws. We criticize them heavily, but we might allow certain kinds of things to abridge freedom of speech or of the press. Okay, well now what is speech? Do we mean literally only verbal words, or do we mean written words? Do we mean expression? And when we get to the press, what is the press? Is it literally the printing press that we use, or is it perhaps something else? And, and, and that's just the First Amendment, right? So think about all of the rights that, that we have enumerated in all of the sorts of ambiguities, which are inherent any time we pass a law, because there are always going to be these, these gray areas. We, we, if we didn't, law school would be significantly shorter and easier than it is now. Um, and, and it's not, and so that's why the court matters. And that's why we should care about the integrity of the court system and, and, and things along those lines because, um, because it, it has enormous consequence for all. Well. Let me ask you, I mean, one of the things that I think has become popular, uh, people talk about a lot since 2016, is that, as you were saying, many of the things we think of as being rights are in fact custom or interpretations. I remember right after Trump was elected in 2016, I went to a talk by Masha Gessen, who now writes for The New Yorker, and she had covered Putin in Russia. And she said in this, you know, charming Russian accent, she said, you know, you Americans will learn how many things you think are fundamental and are laws are in fact just habits and customs. And that's something that they've seen in Russia. So I wonder in that context, do you worry that what's going on with the courts, is there more polarization on the courts? And is that creating, you know, kind of this world in which things that we thought were taking or in fact not, that we thought were laws, that we thought were eternal as far as the U.S. goes, in fact could be uh, changed or, or, or adjusted in some way, and maybe should be. 
So, right. So anytime you see a lot of activity, judicially um, or at the executive and legislative level, you're going to get a, a lot more probably margin cases or things that this sort of are challenged in the margins that might not have traditionally been so. And, and I do uh, have a tendency to worry about the norms that are eroding here. Uh, so there's, there's a simple example uh, in the world that I, I teach in that gives a, a, um, an illustration of what might happen if we, if we fail to respect a long-standing series of norms. So as part of my research, I researched the Federal <laughs> Trade Commission, which is a, a commission that not a lot of people think of, but it's a really important commission that it, uh, handles consumer protection uh, and matters and antitrust matters. In other words, competition issues when big companies get too big and start abusing their monopolistic power. The FTC is supposed to control that. Now, one of the best features, I think, of the Federal Trade Commission is that it is bipartisan. In other words, there is a rule built into the makeup. So there are five commissioners that head up the FTC. And by rule, no more than three commissioners can be from one political party, right? So we have a built-in sort of series where we try to make this a bipartisan commission. Historically, it has been a bipartisan commission and it's operated in a bipartisan way. Now, that's not to say that when there are, uh, when the, the three of the five are from one political party that you don't sort of veer one way or the other. Naturally, you tend to do that. But one of the things that came up, when you have uh, executive authority that's more unpredictable or active than it used to be, is uh, there's a lot, again, here we get with the ambiguity. You can imagine, it, it, the fact that no more than three commissioners would come from one political party has always been interpreted to mean something like, well, the other two would come from the other party within uh, the dominant party, right, within a two-party system. It doesn't have to mean that. You could imagine, for example, a, a series of nominations that bucked widespread tradition, bucked the norms that we're used to, and say, I'm going to nominate three conservative members uh, from the Republican Party, and two people from like the Green Party or the Libertarian Party, or another one of a, a, one of the non-mainstream parties um, to sort of read it that would really, I think, throw a lot of the nomination process for these federal agencies into a bit of chaos. And so that's just a small sort of version. Now that didn't actually happen. We actually have uh, we are now have a, a straight series of nominations. Everything has been sort of done previously. Um, but but then there's a, there's another worry that I have, it always is in the back of my mind, and probably in the back of the mind of people, law professors everywhere that teach case-related and case-relevant law. In other words, if you think about law, you could have several different kinds. And so actually, I, I teach first-year law students, and, and on the first day of class, I walked in, and I said, what is the law? And we sort of had it back and forth. And most people say it's what Congress says it is. Um, which is, is, in a sense, true, right? So legislative bodies pass statutes. But the law is all kinds of things. The law is the, the regulations passed by the administrative agencies and the alphabet soup of Washington, D.C. So the FCC and the FTC and the FDA and all the you know, ABC agencies. Um, the law is uh, international treaties, right? That, that nations agree with other nations. And importantly, the law is judging, right? Now, this is, this is a critical sort of thing to grasp. A lot of what we consider to be the law in the United States is actually a series of judicial opinions, opinions that reflect a certain adjudication of a particular dispute. So someone, you know, perhaps we get into a property dispute, for example. I have a tree and it falls over in your yard. Uh, and the apples from that tree fall into your yard, you pick them up and you say, they're my apples now. And I say, no, they were from my tree, they're my apples. We've got a conflict. To court we go, right? And we say, judge, would you please tell us whose apples these are? And the judge says, these are Woody's apples because they were from your tree, you can't just go take them these apples. That forms an opinion. And here's the, here's the important thing. That opinion is supposed to serve as a model for future disputes so that judges, in cases that come after it, can look at that opinion and say, oh, 
This case that I have is like that other previous case, and so I'm going to follow that. This, in, in the law, we call this precedent. And there's this Latin word, because lawyers like to make up Latin words. Um, they're not make up, but use Latin words as it makes them sound smart. Um, called stare decisis, which means let the decision stand. Right? And, and uh, if you, in the entire body of what we know as the common law, and really even constitutional law, is built upon this norm, a basically uniformly agreed upon norm that we're going to hew as closely as we can to previously existing laws. That is what we're talking about when we talk about decisions that may be jeopardized by future Supreme Court justices or the makeup of the Supreme Court is different. They might overturn existing opinions. Um, they can do that. Now, the wouldn't conservatives say, well, yeah, that's what liberals have been doing for 50 years. They took the Dred Scott decision, overturned it, school desegregation. They created, many conservatives believe, a right to privacy that didn't exist in the Constitution. They created Roe versus Wade, which didn't exist before. They created gay marriage, which didn't exist before. So why is what you know the conservatives doing and what McConnell is doing any different than what Lyndon Johnson or John F. Kennedy or sort of William O. Douglas uh, was doing back in the 60s and 70s, when maybe it, it, it was a more spoke word or a liberal consensus as opposed to a conservative. Sure. So I, 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 without commenting on the sort of um, uh, particular tactics or severities of the strategy, uh, it, it matters. It, this, this all sort of makes sense in a way, because if you think about the gaping holes in the law, um, it's, it's difficult to come to a conclusion without bringing your entire perspective as a person on some of these things. Um, one of the popular things that you hear is, is uh, judges only call you know, balls and strikes. They only interpret the law, they don't make the law. Um, but there's, a, there's just a ton of ambiguity sort of built into this because by interpreting the law, you create precedent and you make the law. Uh, and, and, and how you choose to interpret that, you could have a philosophy. Uh, so there are several different philosophies uh, that judges tend to adopt when, when in, interpreting cases. One of them, uh, some of you may have heard, is, is originalism. Right? This is one way to have a consistent, you know, in theory, uh, set of rules as you, as you ask yourself, what were, when, what were the, basically the framers of the Constitution thinking when they created this, we're going to try to you know, cue closely to that as possible. Um, that has its own internal inconsistencies. People that, that have uh, indicated that they, they, they are originalist style scholars. Um, sometimes if you look at their opinions, they appear to be such. There's another example we say, I don't care what was intended, I only care what the, the, the words actually say. This is textual. I look at the text. Um, There's a, a famous scholar, Hugo Blackman, that says it means what it says and it says what it means, right? And, and Congress shall make no law, meant Congress shall make no law. And, and it was sort of incredibly absolute and, and authoritative. And so, um, and, and then there's another idea, which is that uh, we are not a society caught in time in one particular place. We change. Things that we thought were acceptable in the 1700s, late 1700s, uh, uh, we now have come to realize are no longer acceptable. And, 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 and if we change as a people, then the rules that we have have to change with it. And these are these sort of different sort of philosophies that judges come to bear. And in, in, in many ways, they were a lot of the, uh, the result of a lot of what happened in the 1960s, where we saw uh, a lot of evolution of our understanding of rights. Um, it, you know, when presented with sort of facts that, that no longer make sense in the world that we lived in, um, and, and, and in fact, actively seem to cut against uh, some sort of, uh, of progress and, and evolution. Uh, justices found certain things in, in my area, uh, active in the free speech. In the 1960s, one of the most important decisions ever was created, which is uh, the uh, basically a bolstering of free speech rights for press. Uh, there was a there was a decision uh, called New York Times versus Sullivan that said for the very first time that. Uh, basically, it was okay if newspapers 
made a mistake in reporting about public events and public things. And then as long as they didn't do it with knowledge that what they were printing was false, or in reckless disregard of the truth, then they could actually publish something that was even defamatory to, to public figures. That was nowhere in the Constitution. It, it, it was almost a wholesale invented, but um, in that, not to the ground up, it was supported with logic, it was, it was supported with, with a lot of theory and, and even some sorts of precedent. Um, but, but without that opinion, which I consider to be one of the most important opinions ever that the Supreme Court has passed, uh, essentially, media could no longer function. And not just that, not just journalism. Every single platform that we use today, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Google, it would all be gone because it would be sued out of existence due to the lack of protections that were found back in the 1960s. So it also shows the, the, the importance and the permanence of some of these sorts of opinions. But if, if if we fail to sort of start to, to respect a lot of those precedents, um, which really are just a sort of collective set of a, an approach to the law, uh, then things can change. Let me ask you about that, um, about the First Amendment, because um, obviously now there's a lot of concern about Facebook and Twitter. And, and I think questions sort of on two sides. One, kind of the free speech side. Are these, are these free speech, or they, should they be covered by free speech? Or are they just commercial enterprises? Should they be regulated? And the privacy issues, um, which are people are giving enormous information to these um, organizations and how are they using it? It seems to me those are two areas that we could see before the court. You know, we begin to focus on things like abortion or DACA or things like that that are current. But what about these, which are something that the founding fathers never could have conceived of, and even 20 years ago would have had a hard time imagining the issues that. Up here. Absolutely. So I think these these privacy and free speech are two of the most interesting topics likely to face this new court um, uh, over the next five to ten years. And of course, the reason why in, is uh, is almost solely attributable due to better technologies. Better technologies <laughs> create lots of new opportunities, but they also create new problems. And so we think about um, Facebook, and, and now the, the the free speech debate surrounding Facebook has, has really evolved dramatically even over the past six months to a year to where we have lots of discussions about, well, now Facebook is acting as the arbiter of lots of speech. So Facebook, which is now our sort of public square, Twitter, um, gets to choose what speech stays up and gets to choose what speech gets taken down. And inherently, we, we, we feel a little nervous about that because who is Facebook to say what's good and what's bad? This is actually the entire premise behind the First Amendment in the first place, which is that we don't trust centralized powers to tell us what we should be hearing and what we should be thinking because who is this you know, centralized, uh, top-down person making a decision for us? I don't know. Maybe I do want to see that, right, for example. And so we say, okay, so I've got some, some free speech worries here. But on the other hand, if we say, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to say the First Amendment applies to Facebook as a utility. And, and Facebook now is basically a government actor. And government actors can't tell us what we can say or what we can't say. That's, that's, the, that's the whole point of the First Amendment. And if we treat Facebook as though we're a government actors, though we're the arbiter, then things get difficult really quickly as well, because maybe it's easy to say something like Facebook is, you know, a public utility that should be regulated as such. But what about a small startup app that does the same thing as Facebook but only has four thousand users or two hundred users? I would say, okay, well maybe maybe they don't. And then it's hard to find a coherent reason to say Facebook can or can't, but this one can. And then you can imagine, what if you hosted your own website? Right, what if you created your own chat room and you wanted uh, uh, to have it be on anything you wanted to? You could be because you're a huge um, Pokemon Go fan. And you only or it could be Infowars. Or it could be Infowars. Or it could be a support system for people that have suffered some sort of traumatic event the same as you. And you only want people to post supportive things or not to come in 
and sink the entire forum by posting a bunch of garbage or posting things that are intentionally designed to elicit fear. And so you want to be able to moderate that. All of a sudden, if we say, well, platforms now are basically state actors and, and have to let everybody speak, then we've corrupted that sort of ecosystem as well. So there's a really careful balance and, and a really difficult one. And it's one that the more I think about, the more confused I get. And I have to say, it's, it's one of the reasons I think we should really care about courts, generally speaking, and, and why you know elections matter because these big problems are going to come before the court. And I, don't, I don't know what the answer should be. And I, and I think that anyone that hasn't totally figured out um, hasn't, hasn't really thought about all the particular nuances that are there. Um, even even the simplest decision about moderating content and that strikes me as infinitely complex. Um, we want so there's a reason why everybody's Twitter and Facebook feeds don't have a bunch of violence and pornography in them. That's because Facebook and Twitter and all these other companies filter it out. Most people presumably think that's a, that's a good thing. And then at the margins, we have difficulty determining. What should say up and what shouldn't, and, and we could we could ask for consistency, but it's so hard to craft rules given the ambiguity, um, and it's so hard for the technologies we would maybe want machine learning to sort of automatically pull things. But but the, the the more I sort of dig into it, the more the more confusing it gets. And what about privacy? How are we entering a new world? Do you think the debate is shifting? Where, where do you see that going? Yeah. So this is actually this is the thing that I think about basically all day. Um, so I. I started studying privacy in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And technologically speaking, the world was very different than it is now. Most notably, the iPhone and social media did not exist. But other technologies that are getting better and better by the day, <laughs> such as biometric technologies, specifically I'm thinking of facial recognition technologies, are getting quite good. <laughs> The reason why I lose sleep at night is because the traditional legal doctrine was built around an idea that if you share information with other people, then it is no longer private. Now that may have made sense at some point before the ubiquity of listening devices, before every single person carried an iPhone, in their pockets, um, but there were a series of rules that basically said if you share information with a third party, if you walk around in public, then you have no privacy in this. And it's sort of as open and shut as that. And now I think we're coming to realize that given these technologies and the way in which they act upon us, there's a whole spectrum. Some things are very private, some things are very public, and then there's a lot that's in the middle. And if you think about technologies like facial recognition technologies, the court is eventually going to be asked, if someone were to use that on you, everywhere you went, but only in public spaces, so imagine that your face print, which is actually what's used to use facial recognition technologies, and it's little dots, and there's a, it's, it's stored digitally, and it could track you wherever you went. So starting at the end of this class, this, as soon as you step out onto the campus of Northeastern University, everywhere you go in public will be tracked and stored and made searchable by a government entity or perhaps industry. Um, have, has that government entity or that industry violated your sense of privacy? Now, based on the traditional existing doctrine, if we're talking about constitutional or we're talking about the government, we're talking about the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits um, unreasonable search and seizures, they haven't, because it's not private, because you walk around in public. Yet all of these incredibly revealing things can be uh, ascertained from following you around in public. So you go to your oncologist, that reveals something about you. The number of times in which you go to the apartments of someone who is not your spouse, two in the morning, that would be reveal something. Right? Um, even our sort of daily things can, can be predictable in game so that we know exactly when you're away from your house. So that it would be nice time to roll it. Right? So there are all these things that, that we can do, and the courts 
is leaning right now, leaning in a direction of saying privacy is more complicated than just if it's if you keep it to yourself, it's private, and if you share it with other people, it's public. But that could change. It could change depending on who is nominated. It could change depending on, on the, the nature of the dispute um, that comes before the Supreme Court. The most recent opinion that we have here is what we call a Carpenter opinion. Um, which actually was favorable and started to recognize a little nuanced understanding of privacy. But that can change real quick because it's, it's, it's baby steps. The way that the court typically proceeds. We have this, we have this idea that courts um, can dramatically take a left turn overnight, but that's usually not how it works. Even, even in cases where we think we have an active court, not, and not, I didn't use the word active, this just active. Typically the courts sort of moves and shifts right here and there. Now, every now and then there's a really big opinion and it makes a really big statement and it matters. But for the most time, courts tend to just slowly inch, right? And, and what I fear is if, if we have justices that don't appreciate the nuances of privacy and the way that power is distributed through surveillance systems, then we're going to have a very slow and painful um, retrenchment of the old guard, which is if you share it in public, it's no longer private. And that strikes me as really problematic. Okay, uh, why don't we open it to questions now um, on sort of these topics before we uh, switch into other ones. Uh, Doc will find you. Exactly on the question of privacy. Um, it isn't in the Constitution, I believe, and, and it's really based on a Harvard Law Review article by S.D. Warren. Uh, which uh, had to do with the fact that he was married to a socialite daughter of a senator and was offended by things in newspapers. Um, so supposing we get Supreme Court justices who are really originalists and they say, why, why should we be basing anything on, on this right, which was uh, uh, early 20s, the late 19th century uh, uh, writing? Sure. So this is a great question, and it's it. I, I it is true actually that the word privacy doesn't appear in the Constitution. Um, but one of the things that I, I so I teach information privacy law here in Houston, uh, and one of the things that I talk about and that I do in my class is I actually write out lots of different parts of the Constitution that don't use the word privacy, but actually, if you really think about it, are are really privacy based. Um, one of them would be the Third Amendment, which keeps soldiers from being quartered in your house. That's at least partially based on privacy, particularly when you look at the, the, the cases that come out where the house holds an incredibly special place, a, a private place. If anything is private in this world, it is the insides of your house. Uh, I mean, until we all you know, have a license and they watch us forever. That is. Um, uh, if you look at the Fourth Amendment, it actually doesn't use the word privacy. It says unreasonable searches and seizures. But searching is a, is a, a privacy corrosive activity. Right? In other words, it's looking, it's, it's, it's information seeking. Um, the Fifth Amendment, the right to self the right to, um, to not have to, to incriminate yourself. Even that is sort of privacy based. If we think about privacy in terms of something beyond just secrets, right? Or whether control or some sort of autonomy or some sort of dignitary right. So uh, it, it, in it, one of the great ironies of talking about privacy and being a privacy professor is that privacy as a word, it, I find it to be incredibly useful as an introductory term and, and totally worthless as a term of art because it can mean whatever you want it to mean, right? I, it, on the first day of class, I say, I, I have 20 students. And I'll write, you know, one through twenty on the board, and I say, define privacy for me, and I get twenty different answers, and no one, no one's definitively defined it. And so this is, and so to to, to echo your point, um, this is where judges become important because judges don't get to don't get to be like me, and you know, law professors have the, the super privileged position of saying, who knows what it means, and then sort of folding your hands back and and being content with it, whereas judges actually have to say what it is. Um, and their conceptualization of privacy will likely drive the ultimate resolution of a lot of these opinions, 
And there's there's no, um, at least legally speaking, no right or wrong way to conceptualize that privacy. I mean, I've got my own opinions about what privacy is, but 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 people come to that in lots of different ways, and and, and it is an interesting sort of dynamic. What what direction? Assuming that uh, Kavanaugh were to be approved, what direction do you see the Supreme Court taking in relation to uh, issues of privacy? So you, you, you intuited where I was going with some of this. Um, if you look at uh, some of, of Judge Kavanaugh's statements and background and, and other, um, other opinions, you'll, I think you will see glimpses of the traditional articulation of privacy and surveillance and the role of privacy and surveillance. Um, there's, a, there's a really good essay uh, written by a colleague of mine named Margo Kaminsky at the University of Colorado that wrote about this and said it actually doesn't tend to follow the, the, the path of the current justices, many of them across the political spectrum, mind you, tend to uh, support a more nuanced uh, approach to privacy. So in one of the famous cases, which I think is really interesting, is the U.S. v. Jones. And the U.S. v. Jones case was a case where uh, law enforcement had placed a, 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 a GPS technology physically on um, a, a suspect's car, and the warrant had expired and didn't read the warrant, which meant possibly that it was a violation of the Fourth Amendment if it was a search. And there was a majority that, that found that, that indeed it was a search. And then there were two concurring opinions that looked a lot like each other. One was, was written um, by Justice Sotomayor, and the other was by Justice Alito, both of whom said, you know, privacy is a little more complicated than just if it's a secret to you, it's private, and if you share with anybody, it's not. Um, and I don't, I'm, I don't know, based on what we've seen, if that's what we would get um, if, if Kevin Hall were confirmed. Um, now, that being said, oftentimes what you see, the, the, the flip side of this point, the coin, of course, is that privacy doesn't exist in the back. These decisions are made with, often with competing interests. Uh, sometimes the interests are freedom of speech. Sometimes the interests are national security or safety. Um, oftentimes, the, 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 the view that people have of privacy can be, well, it hides the bad guys. I've been personally critical of uh, facial recognition technologies in a lot of my research, but there is an upside to that, which is um, if if facial recognition technology becomes ubiquitous and nobody becomes lost, missing people can be found um, quickly. My bad. Bad guys can be found, right? And so, so there are costs, and it's it's not something that I want to to say. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's clearly black and white, but I do see that as as Possibly a, a if, if you, in reading tea leaves is a favorite of all professors, but I confess I'm not very good at it. Um, but it's possibly a, a slow, uh, a, a slowdown of that particular trajectory that we've seen before. Northeastern has a number of programs that involve um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the new technologies and national security. And uh, not all of the uh, students, many of whom are global, um, who are in those programs are necessarily going to think to enroll in your course in the law school. And, and some of them are here. And I wonder what um, you would say the key issues are that they ought to be thinking about uh, in terms of the uh, development of new technologies and national security. Uh, with particular reference to uh, privacy. Thank you so much for that. It, I love this question, not only because it gives me the opportunity to say, not only am I, do I have an appointment at the law school, but I do also have an appointment at the College of Computer and Information Science, where I do teach um, uh, computer science and information science students. Many of them will be building a lot of these systems uh, about ethics and law. And and for those that don't get to have me in my undergraduate class at CCIS, um, the things that I would say is that machine learning is this incredible, revolutionary tool. And it's something 
Well, since this is about courts, the court's going to have to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence as well. Eventually. Right? It's in its nascent stage. So I've been going to a conference called the We Robot Conference, which is the policy on, on law and robotics only. It's only in its like seventh or eighth year. And uh, and I think that there are a number of things that we have to look out for. One of the things, actually the key thing that will inform all the other things is to remember that as you build a technology, and you're right, many people at Northeastern are involved in the process of building technologies. Remember that no technology is value neutral. Every single technology that you build is going to have an impact on the world. And if you neglect to make certain kinds of decisions about the technology, then that will also have an impact on the world. And then ethics are actually baked into the technology. And so we have to be very careful about our own biases, because we all have them. And they end up, particularly in machine learning and automated systems, they sort of work their way into the system. So if we, if we choose a bad data set, for example, machine learning relies upon these large data sets to learn, right? That's how we, we I use scare quotes, that's how we educate automated systems. If that data set is biased, for example, it has an underrepresentation of a particular group, then it's going to make biased decisions. Right? And it's going to get us to a place that we, that we might not be otherwise. And privacy is enough. These are surveillance systems. Surveillance can be incredibly useful. Surveillance can help us, again, find missing people, help us find the bad guy. It, it, can, it can help those who um, cannot see, see in a room, right, and, and, and know who's out there. Um, there's, there's an amazing amount. It, on, on a casual level, facial recognition technologies can help you finally, for once and for all, organize your photo collection online. Right? You've got 17,000 photos that you've taken over the past 10 years, and you've never looked at them because you know, who knows who's in those pictures. So there are all these sort of uses of these technologies. But, but the thing that I really want to emphasize here is that surveillance is power. And when you build surveillance systems, you are, you are either exercising power yourself or you are giving that power to someone else. And the only thing that I would ask is that we should be conscious about the ways in which we build those systems and how we delegate that power to other people. Um, because the way in which we see surveillance systems used is they're often abused against um, vulnerable populations. They're often the first to feel the brunt of a lot of these systems. And so the only thing I wanna ask is that we keep those things in mind. Um, and, then, and then we all have a role to play in talking about these systems and thinking critically about how we use these systems. Because there's a feedback loop, because I'm gonna tie this back to the courts again. There's a feedback loop that we all have when we use these technologies, the way we talk about these technologies and what we demand of these technologies, industry wants to give to us, right? They just want to give us what we want. If we're going to use it more than they're going to give it to us. And courts then, in seeing these disputes, look around and they say, well, everybody's doing this. This seems to be normal. What's the problem with this? And so um, if we want to see change in these systems, then, then some of it, I mean, we need better rules. I think we need consistent rules. But some of it, I, I think, even starts in the way in which we talk about these technologies and the way in which we use these technologies and, and the technologies we purchase. Um, I'm, I just found out that the new Apple iPhone is getting rid of the thumbprint, thumbprint reader and is only going to have facial recognition technology options along with the keypad over Is that right? If that's true, it makes me sad because I, I, don't, I don't want that. I actually, I, I, I don't love facial recognition technology for that purpose, but, but it, the only way that they're going to change it is people stop by those phones, which I don't see any time. Um, professor, over here. Okay. Um, this is a kind of cryptocurrency privacy voted question. Um, so obviously now there's a lot of debate, you know, with the SEC about how to regulate the ICO sure. crypto market, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, if, the government steps in and takes a hard stance on this, you know, this could kill the trading volumes for a lot of privacy coins like Monero, right? It could potentially kill a lot of work on projects related to, you know, secret contracts or off-chain smart contracts, which are, you know, both elements that could give a lot of privacy transactions. So my question to you is, where do you see, you know, potential regulation of this market 
and the nexus of privacy? And do you think that, you know, if the governments were to take maybe a lesser kind of stance and let the market flourish, do you think that that could have, you know, implications for privacy and transaction um, security? And then consequently, um, you know, what are your thoughts on just where we should be standing in terms of regulation? Sure, sure. So for those that don't know, this is a question about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, and, and I assume blockchain, let's just correct me. So uh, cryptocurrency, I taught my very first year that I was a law professor. Uh, I thought I was going to be teaching privacy law and intellectual property, and I showed up and I said, congratulations, you're teaching payment systems. And I said, okay, I will teach payment systems and I'm happy to do so, but it, it, I, I'm technologically focused in, in most of my research. And so I said, can I teach a little bit about um, a thing that at the time was brand new that no one had ever heard of called Bitcoin? Many of you may have now heard of Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin uses a, a, a technology, leverages a technology known as the blockchain. And a blockchain is just a fancy word for a distributed ledger. Think of an account. You got debits, you got credits, and then think of everybody that's using the technology having a copy of that that sort of rotates around. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the there's there's that technology, and then there's the fact that these technologies are being used for fundraising efforts because they could be potentially valuable. Um, and and in, in the same way that companies have an initial public offering, sometimes there are these things known as initial coin offerings. Um, I think, I think uh, now that literally is the, the extent to which I, I have felt deeply about um, blockchain. So I, I'm going to, I think, maybe disappoint in the answer, answering the question fully because I'm not a, a cryptocurrency expert. Um, I do see possible value in having uh, uh, what we call blockchain technologies uh, for privacy purposes. And, and, and what we mean by that is, if we were to use these technologies to pay, then it's possibly a way for us to pay in a, I'm gonna use the word relatively anonymous way, because I'm not convinced that it's totally anonymous, but for example, um, right now you pay in cash. If you pay in cash, you go to the store, you put your money down, you buy a banana or <coughs> lunch or a particular magazine to reveal certain kinds of interests, Nobody knows who you are, right? The clerk might recognize you unless they're using facial recognition technology and we totally recognize you. Um, which also goes to show that there are limits, you know, technologies don't exist in a vacuum, that even if we, but, but online there's this possibility of using these cryptocurrencies for anonymous transactions, which would be privacy protective in a certain way. When I pitched this to my class, they said, privacy protective technologies, it's like using cash, but online, I'm for it. And then they, and they love it and they're really excited about it. And then you mentioned like the black market online, what they call the Silk Road. They say, but it also could be used to purchase drugs and weapons and you know, perhaps you know, something else, maybe for child pornography. Everyone goes, oh, wait, I've got concerns about that. Um, and so there, there are two sides to that. Um, but I do think that it's worth, generally speaking, keeping your mind open about these sort of blockchains. Uh, and my guess is that the law will follow the same pattern that it does with lots of new technologies, where it tends to hold off until it can't hold off anymore. Uh, that, that seems to be a pretty good strategy for a lot of technologies. I'm skeptical for other technologies, but, but generally speaking, if you look back at, does, does anyone remember when the internet first became a thing? Some people in the room, probably, maybe not others. When Al Gore invented it? Right, right. When he invented it in the very beginning. The way that, that courts actually, so I'm bringing it back to courts, but I like to bring it always back. The way that courts treated the internet when it first came out, it was as though it were this delicate little baby that you had to, to take very special care of. And that if, if any bruises were to get on the baby at all, it might not grow up to be as big and as strong as you wanted it to be. And, and it turns out that that strategy largely paid off, right? So now the internet is the indispensable technology in our lives, for, for better or for worse. Um, and, and I anticipate that that strategy of largely staying hands off was so wildly effective. It basically created uh, what the modern version of Silicon Valley, 
that you would see that replicated, not just legislatively, but, but it's, it's become sort of ingrained in the psyche of, of, of America, generally speaking. We gave birth to Silicon Valley, right? We, we get into fights sometimes with other countries, like, where's your Google? We're the one that has Google. Um, and, uh, and I imagine that that will, will lead a lot of similar sorts of technologies. Um, okay, let me uh, switch gears um, and uh, talk about something indelicate, um, which is uh, the Me Too movement and Anita Hill. Um, recognizing that um, for many of the students here, um, Anita Hill is something maybe they heard about from their parents or are suddenly um, hearing about it. Um, let me uh, show this video um, about the um, Clarence Thomas hearing um, with Anita Hill. I just want to preface this by saying these were very lurid hearings, as many of us who watched them recall. In watching this video, I forgot how lurid they were. So I, I just want to let people know this is not something that was never shown on TV. It's something all of America was watching um, back then. Uh, um, are you saying that national people might be He looked at the can. This is a service. It's a national disgrace. He looked at the can and asked, who has put pubic hair on my coat? I don't think I should be here today. On other occasions, he referred to the size of his own penis as being larger than normal. I don't think that this inquisition should be going on. He also spoke on some occasions of the pleasures he had given to women. The oral sex. In the fall of 1991, Supreme Court nominee Judge Clarence Thomas faces lurid accusations at a Senate hearing. And for the first time, the seedy world of pornography is dragged onto a very public stage. He used the name that he had been referred to in the pornographic material. To recall it was. Yes, it did. Um, the name that was referred to was Long Dong Silver. Attorney Anita Hill is an ex-employee of Thomas. Her vivid testimony sends C-SPAN's viewing ratings through the roof. The Anita Hill case probably was precedent setting for that kind of language to be brought to Congress and to be legitimized. As soon as you talk about anything that has to do with sex, uh, you know, human beings are going to be interested in that. That wasn't created by the media. Human beings are interested in sex. I felt that implicit in this discussion about sex was the offer to have sex with him. This today is a travesty. I think that it is disgusting. Such an explosive mix of race, sex, and politics has never been witnessed on live TV before. Looking back on the 90s gives you a sense of how much our sexual attitudes have changed. I mean, keep in mind, it wasn't that long ago, but this was before every American man was marinating in pornography. Because of television, because of the People Magazine type syndrome of everything is in our faces and we are in people's bedrooms now practically, which at first blush, seriously cause problems for the people involved. I mean, whether it's Clarence Thomas or President Clinton. Nomination of Clarence Thomas of Georgia to be Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court is hereby confirmed. He was the closest court confirmation vote in 103 years. With so much dirty linen being washed in public, sexual harassment, be all or imagined, can no longer be ignored. So um, both of you are lawyers, uh, and so I want to ask you if uh, Professor Christine Ford called you right now and asked for your advice about whether or not she should testify on Monday, what would you tell her? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, well, this is a very uh, personal viewpoint. Uh, driven by um, my own experience in um, having um, had my life objectified uh, by a particular event that, uh, that took place. 
Um, and in our uh, previous class, the, the class for matriculating students, the question came up. Um, and oh yeah, that. And um, so for those of you who don't know this, this is uh, during busing in Boston desegregation in the 1970s. Um, this is a, a Mike. Mike. Oh. Mike, please. Mike, please. <laughs> what he's getting at is that that's me in the picture. This is uh, this handsome young man was crossing City Hall yeah. Plaza um, on his way to a meeting, and this was during an anti-busing riot on City Hall. And this picture won a Pulitzer Prize, and in many ways became the distinctive picture um, of, of Boston's racial attitudes. Right, and um, you know what I've often described is the way uh, my engagement with that. Uh, activity, which was clearly involuntary on my part, um, very much disrupted the rest of my life um, and uh, changed in both positive and negative ways uh, the uh, career that I had, the personal life that I had arranged both things. And what I said to the students is that um, when uh, one is confronted with uh, the the uh, sense that uh, one should uh, put one's life on the line, in effect. You really do have to think uh, about the implications uh, that going public with something or becoming really a public figure who's not an entertainer as such or an athlete uh, or an elected official. Uh, one really does have to think about the implications that that has for the rest of one's personal life. Um, if uh, one's sense of conscience is such uh, that moving forward with uh, the exposure uh, that uh, she will face um, seems worth it to you in terms of the disruption that it's going to cause uh, to your personal life, um, then you should move forward with it. Um, but you have to weigh the negative downside of that because everyone who is not that person will um, see you as uh, an object and will see the value of your moving forward to represent them um, under circumstances that they may or may not have actually been in. And so it's easy for people outside of oneself to make the choice that an individual needs to go forward. But it's not so easy for this particular individual who um, is a university professor, a college professor, uh, who has a family, who has children, who has friends, who has neighbors, uh, to necessarily uh, make uh, that particular kind of choice. And if she were to come to me, I wouldn't necessarily say yes or no, but I would tell her that she would have to weigh all of the personal implications of moving forward. The corollary to that is the very difficult question, I think, of how and when one makes uh, the decision to act on the basis of one's conscience. If we are in a work environment, and I brought this up with our students, if you're in a work environment where you are a woman and uh, it, it's a male-dominated uh, profession, being a fireman, for example, and all of the other workers are uh, posting on their lockers pictures of uh, women that you would find repugnant. Um, to what extent, when and how do you, uh, out of uh, conscience, object to that, knowing that you might then either lose your job or find yourself in a work situation where your life literally might be placed at risk? Um, if you are in a family environment um, and it's Thanksgiving and families all come together and you know that there are people in the family um, who hold uh, political or cultural or social views that are repugnant to yours, uh, do you uh, at the Thanksgiving table uh, raise the issue of uh, what you consider to be inappropriate language at that table or inappropriate views. Um, how do you raise these questions with your children? 
if you were um, the neighbor of one of the Japanese citizens who was removed from their home uh, in the 1940s and sent off to so-called internment camps, and you knew that most people in the country were not aware of that, would you raise that issue at that moment and how would you do it? Those are all acts of conscience that were covered, I think, very well in, in a film like uh, Marcel Ophuls, the, the Sorrow and the, and the Pity, where um, neighbors of Jewish families in France knew perfectly well that their neighbors were being sent away to be killed, and yet, in retrospect, you looked at them and they seemed like perfectly normal people who chose not to act on conscience uh, to raise the issue. So there is a fundamental issue of, of when conscience uh, comes into play. There are also circumstantial issues. How long before did it take place? What was the culture of the place where it took place? Uh, what, what was the risk that one assumed by uh, raising the cultural issue, <coughs> excuse me, in a, a public setting? So for me, the advice is, um, what are your fundamental values and, and how do those fundamental values uh, translate from your sense of conscience into your sense of action? And then it's up to the individual to make that choice. I can't dictate a person's conscience or values, but I can advise them as an attorney as to uh, what the risks are and also what the risks are of remaining silent. Can you talk about that? Because that's clearly an issue here, right? It's quite possible that she may decline to appear. There won't be an FBI investigation, whatever happens, and things will go forward. I think that's clearly an option at this point. Or she could have said, no, I'm not going to send the letter, or no, I'm not going to talk to the Washington Post. How would that have played out if she? Well, the other thing I would just note is that I am extremely troubled by the way the uh, potential confrontation in front of a uh, uh, congressional committee uh, might take place, ne place next week or, or at some point in the future. And that is to say, the structure as it has been presented to us up to now um, places uh, two individuals um, at a, a, a table, a witness table, uh, giving sworn testimony, where it is the person who was offended, abused, uh, uh, mistreated, who is required to produce the burden of proof that this bad thing happened and told a priori that she can't produce witnesses or that she has three days to find witnesses to come forward to support um, her assertions. And that is an, an extremely unbalanced circumstance because um, all Kavanaugh has to do is say, I didn't do it, and then say nothing further. Um, th th there's no burden on him to prove that he didn't do it because you can't very well prove that you didn't do something you didn't know to do. And um, th th that in itself, it seems to me, is, is uh, a fundamental betrayal of uh, a, a, a fundamental procedural safeguard that ought to be built into uh, whatever happens in a way that um, protects both individuals and tries to get to the truth. Well, what do you, what's your take on all this? If she called you up and asked for advice. So I don't have much to add to that response. Thank you for that perspective and events. And I think that's, that I'm too troubled by the sort of looming uh, confrontation in a way that, that wouldn't protect um, I think the victim and actually wouldn't be like like a court of law at all, right? At, at all, because there, there are no you know, rules of evidence or, or burdens of proof. Um, but I, I mean, how do you cancel the council decision like this? Let me say a word about the costs, because it's something that that's, that I've done some research and some colleagues of mine have done more research on on coming forward um, uh, with with testimony, like is, is what's being proposed. And so um, when you come forward to, uh, to tell your story, 
when people that are assaulted come forward and tell their story, you know there are a predictable number of costs that you will face. Heavy, incredible costs in, in the average circumstance. Right? So not in this, what we would say would be an exceptional circumstance. Um, we know that your integrity will be questioned. There will be a series of questions that, that routinely get asked, um, that will be asked of you. Uh, people in authority um, are uh, maybe reluctant to believe you. We've seen that historically sort of happen. Um, that's to say nothing of the hypercharged world in which we see a lot of this playing out with Twitter and Facebook and the sort of harassment that is that you you know for certainty is coming your way. Um, we know that, it, that this sort of burden is disproportionately felt by women, people of color, particularly women of color. Um, we know that that uh, there's very little that you can do about it. Tech companies uh, have have built a thing they have, they have have lost a lot of control over. Um, how do you how do you simultaneously shut down two hundred thousand? Voices uh, trying to dox you, yell at you, scream at you, um, to say nothing of the real world consequences that come from from coming forward with your story. Um, and that's again to say nothing of this particular scenario where you don't have this story um, and and playing out in a court of law where we have rules designed to get at the actual truth. Um, and we have burdens of proof. Rather, we have a scenario whereby the uh, the victim has to carry the brunt of a lot of this. And if, if someone wants to to grandstand for for an hour, you know, for an hour, there's there there are very few rules uh, around what will happen. And so um, and so it's 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 an incredible, um, unthinkable, I think, burden that, that we're facing here. So. And so that's just what seems to me to be clear, uh, you know. The, the other thing I just add, uh, you know, given the subject of um, of this semester's open classroom, and also uh, last semester's for those of you who were here, where we talked about the rule of law in a time of turmoil, um, when individuals are not willing to come forward. Uh, with the uh, assertion of fundamental truths in a democracy, uh, then the result is inevitably anarchy. Uh, the society falls apart. Um, people have to have a framework where they can trust that what they know and are being told has validity. In the absence of that, Anything goes. So, for example, when I worked in the mayor's office and we were trying to reduce uh, the murder rate in the city, we had to rely upon people in the community who were willing to come forward and tell us who the drug dealers or gangbangers were. In the absence of their coming forward, the anarchy that existed on the streets would have continued. And people needed to know that if they came forward with the truth, they would be protected which we did. But in the absence of that, the society falls apart. And I would submit that, um, at least at this moment, part of the reason that the perceived credibility of many of our institutions has declined so precipitously over the last couple of years is that no one knows what the truth is anymore. And in fact, if there's a contrary proposition, it is that we as citizens are being lied to all the time. And that it's only an informed press and a court that works really judiciously to root out the truth. It's only an informed press and an honest court that maintains the fundamental principles of how a democracy has to work. In the absence of those, it's either anarchy or tyranny. Because, as in 1984 or any of another uh, other uh, works that have been uh, written, 
you look around yourself and you see that the truth exists almost entirely in the mind of one or two or three people, or the 12 people we talked about last week who reputedly uh, Spiro Agnew felt controlled all of the uh, media in this country in the early 80s. If, if, if you don't have uh, a, a shared consensus around what the truth is, and then you, you live in a state of anarchy. Yeah, I would also add to that, and then we'll open up to questions. One thing that's interesting to me is, you know, people always try to figure out what's Trump up to. And I thought it was striking that uh, uh, Professor Ford had basically said, I'll cooperate, but I want the FBI to investigate. And I will go to the FBI. Now, three, four, five years ago, that would have been the gold standard, right? Well, the FBI investigates it. People would have kind of gathered around and said, well, okay, that's you know an objective thing. Trump's continued attacks on the FBI, I think, created a situation that even if the FBI did get involved, there'd be a segment of people who basically would say, well, you can't trust the FBI because they're part of the deep state and they, you know, they have it in for Trump. That I think this erosion of institutions that you're talking about, you know, takes place over time. As you said, it's not all at once. And so that's one of the things that I find troubling here that there used to be a few institutions that everyone thought, well, at least we can trust them. The military, the FBI, places like that. But even those are now kind of being caught up in this polarization. And I think that allows efforts to kind of agree what the truth is. Um, any questions or thoughts or, or, or observations? Probably more likely comments. <laughs> um, during uh, the Thomas Hill hearings, I was in a car taking a trip and I uh, was locked on in the car and listening to the hearings on the radio. I think it was two or three days. It was a horrifying experience. I can remember it vividly now. I wonder had Anita Hill been white, what would have happened? Um, in my opinion, I, I find it interesting that Clarence Thomas has spoken so rarely on the court. I believe that Dr. Ford um, was probably aware of the Anita Hill hearings because I think she would have been 23 or 24. So what happened to Anita Hill, what happened in those hearings is probably not so removed from her experience. Um, my concern as a, a, a woman in the United States is that the court does not reflect the populace. And a concern that I have as some of this um, information has come out about uh, Judge Kavanaugh is he seems to have come up through a, uh, an experience of white male privilege. Um, this, the recent uh, quotes from his speeches about what happens on the bus, stays on the bus, and. Uh, what's obviously alcohol abuse uh, over a longer period of time is of great concern. Um, and the other thing I think that's of great concern about the court is that it has been, as far as I can tell, and, make it, and will continue to be a political body. And if you're talking about how we assess law, removing the politics from that process might get us to a better way to assess the law, but right now it is fatally flawed by that political process. Yeah, so uh, I think that ideally if we had a, a, a nomination process that were less fraught politically, we'd be significantly better shape because we could sort of evaluate candidates based on, on um, sort of other metrics, hopefully, and hopefully how well would you sort of interpret the law, how, what's your legal acumen. Um, now, it is 
It, is the Supreme Court a political body? Absolutely. And I, I, I think that 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 politics, I mean, political in the sense of dealing with value-based distributions of power, it has to be. That, that's what we ask of it. Um, and not to make uh, every, not to make everything about technology, but there is uh, in in the machine learning world one of the ways in which you can ensure better data sets is that you ensure diverse representation of the people that build the technologies, but also within the data that you pull from. Um, that's a pretty good rule for life. And, and certainly, I think, a good rule for the Supreme Court, where you would want a diverse set of experiences on the Supreme Court, ideally because it's impossible to have a neutral arbiter of laws. I mean, it just, it just in, a, in a sort of theoretical sense, right? I, I, I don't think is possible. So the way in which we counter that is we have a wide diversity, um, one that reflects the values, the, the wide sets of values that we have. You know, given our, um, given that, that you're our law school professor on this panel, um, the question I'd ask is, uh, many folks have expressed concern about how the appointment of Kavanaugh or some other justice uh, might lead to the reversal of certain uh, uh, established laws, principles, uh, as they've been described, such as Roe versus Wade, um, which um, have uh, provided a level of uh, equality for women and others in this society. Um, there was a time when the court uh, ruled in uh, Plessy, for example, that separate but equal was quite right. That was the, the court's consensus. That was the rule of the land. And then 70, 80 years later, a uh, different court looks at uh, somewhat different sets of facts, and in Brown versus Board of Ed in 1954, uh, determines determines that uh, separate but equal is inherently is inherently uh, unequal. So the question is, what changes if if there were a conservative justice who were to be appointed next to the Supreme Court? What are the circumstances that would lead to change in uh, a ruling like? Uh, any of the recent cases that have come down that have spoken to providing equal rights for women? And to what extent does the use of the media play into any of that kind of change? That's a great question. Um, with the premise that uh, I'm not an expert in this particular area of the law, but I can tell you, watching the courts, there's several different ways that change could come about. There's the obvious way. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, it tends to follow precedent, but of course it doesn't have to. If it wanted to, it would wake up the next morning and say, we've changed our mind. And there's not much that could be done about it were that the case. Um, but that's actually not what I fear in terms of this um, what I fear actually is a sort of slow and gradual removal of certain kinds of protection and margin cases that over time you look up and what do you know? Things have changed overnight, right? I mean, seemingly, right? But, but, but it actually was a sort of slow changing one because the way in which a lot of the, the law, common law works in this area is that there are state laws that are created, limitations on reproductive choice, limitations on lots of, of other possible things. Um, and the Supreme Court will say that's a violation of a fundamental right. We're, this, this, and it, it results in what we, we end up saying, this is unconstitutional. Um, and so I don't think that, that the, the most likely Outcome would be 
the outright reversal of a landmark case like Roe v. Wade, um, it is only because of the internal dynamics of a lot of the way in which the court works. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts has been one who tries to find a lot of consensus and majority opinions, and there's been a lot of that. That's just a sort of tendency of this, of this particular court. I mean, what you might see are a series of decisions you know, one by one approve margin cases of things that the state is trying to do. In other words, they don't say, oh, it's no longer a right. They just say, well, in this particular instance, we'll allow it. And in that particular instance, we'll allow it. And in all these particular instances, we'll allow it. And that's where I see, I think, frankly, the most risk and the most danger in that. In that area. Um, uh, to go back to the problem, and I think that it's highly unlikely Professor Ford is going to bring me down. That's just my first opinion. Um, is it on? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, my opinion is that I, I feel that Professor Ford will prevent Kavanaugh from moving forward, but I wonder why uh, it appears that he has lied under oath more than once. and. Is this how, how low we've sunk? That, that doesn't seem to bother anyone. That's my first uh, question. It's a more of a question. But the second is, to, is back to Roe v. Wade. Um, it seems to me that uh, the Supreme Court is one danger. I mean, Roe v. Wade is in danger with the Supreme Court. But women have already lost so much in states across the country. And there doesn't seem to be. Um, a lot enough enough conversation about that because the women who are mostly being affected by these states' laws are poor women because women of means can travel to a state that doesn't allow abortion or they can get their contraception somewhere else. But that seems to me to be such a travesty and it's against I mean Roe v. Wade is constitutionally protected, is it not? So I, I, I'm curious as to what you think about whittling away from the ground up on the Roe v. Wade issue. I think that, that uh, again, with the, the preface that, well, this is not my major research area, this is what we see in, in this and actually other areas of the law um, when you have uh, a change in the complexion of the court, is that it, it doesn't happen dramatically, it happens slowly and over time. And and to, to return to the other question that I actually didn't answer, what's the media's responsibility in all of this. Um, they, uh, there's a theory, uh, when I was getting my, my graduate education in, in journalism and mass communication, there's a theory, and as a genocide theory, which is the media is not good at telling what people think, but it's phenomenally good at telling what people think about. And I think that that's something that's happening here, and that we're seeing it play out uh, in in a, 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 a the media just and, and not uniformly, I understand that the media is not a monolith, but there are lots of media outlets that tend to be attracted to the sensational and to the scandal and um, and to uh, it, it, it almost becomes sort of routinized uh, to a lot of the things that that we are subjected to every single day, such that no one thing sort of rises to the top. Um, and when that fails to get reflected in the media, then it tends to drive the national conversation. And the things that tend to drive national conversations are things that tend to result in uh, electoral differences. Right? And, and, and I have, and, and from my own sort of set of, of, of research and the things that I do study, um, to the extent that, that platforms like Facebook and platforms like Twitter are considered media in the sense that they drive attention and they, they demand eyeballs then they are also um, responsible in how a lot of this message gets handled and, and allowing um, a lot of, of narratives, obviously false narratives, to form. To, and, and then, of course, we get back to the other side, which is, well, if we say they should be more responsible legally, so then we run into problems on the other hand. Yeah, I, I would like to say one word in defense of the, at least the mainstream media. Which is what I think is interesting. I'm not sure if people even noticed it, but yesterday, um, The Guardian, which is in Britain, um, published an article about Stormy Daniels' um, new book, which has more details than you want to know 
about Donald Trump's penis and about what he's like in bed. Uh, in, in, and what I found interesting was how little attention that's given. That I, no one knows what's going to happen with the hearings. No one knows what's going to happen with Kavanaugh. But I am struck by the way in which so much of the mainstream media is looking at questions of Me Too, looking at questions of how Anita Hill was treated, raising some of these serious issues. And I think if you look at the way the Republicans on the panel are responding, they get that. I mean, obviously, you can find the lowest common denominator, and I'm sure there are 200,000 people on Facebook who are coming up with all sorts of theories. But this does appear to be, again, you don't know how it's going to play out. And a week from now, we all may be tearing our hair out. But there does seem to be a way in which that agenda setting might actually be working, in that the, the discussion about this, clearly the Republicans are very careful about what's going to be said, how to frame it. We don't know how the hearings are going to turn out. And this kind of speaks to your first part of your question, which is, you know, if Kavanaugh's lied, why aren't people saying more? Why haven't Republicans responded? I would point out that Bill Clinton lied. And a lot of people who supported Bill Clinton because he was a Democrat, because he supported things that they supported, felt that wasn't important. Uh, and it wasn't something they wanted to think about. And I think there's obviously since been a lot of soul searching on the part of some Democrats about charges that were raised against Bill Clinton, especially in the kind of treatment of women. So what the Republicans are doing essentially is something I think politicians have long done, which is if this person's going to vote for issues I care about, I'll put up with a lot. I'll overlook things. I don't think it's that important. So I'm not sure that what's going on in these hearings from a partisan point of view is that different than it might happen under Democrats. I might be wrong, but that's kind of my take on it. Um, so, um, one of the things that I've seen a lot um, since these allegations came out. Um, uh, is that he was young when this happened, that they were both in high school, that he, uh, how long were we going to hold him if this happened? How long did you hold someone accountable for something that they did when they were a teenager? Um, and that it doesn't affect his ability to do his job, and that but the focus should be, that this is a distraction, and the focus should be on his track record as a judge. Um, and so what do you think, do you think that there's any like credibility to that argument? Should um, this process and searching for a Supreme Court justice just focus on the professional work that he's done, or should it be more to the personal life get involved as well? Well, um, I, I say this not at all facetiously uh, because it, it's the uh, it is the day of atonement, um, and you know in Christianity there's uh, a principle of forgiveness, um, and it, it's always struck me that both atonement and forgiveness require on the part of the bad actor a conscious an intentional act to seek either atonement or forgiveness, and a recognition or acknowledgement that the thing that the individual did was bad or wrong or offensive, and that that uh, atonement or forgiveness only comes about through what in effect is um, an act of seeking on the part of uh, the bad actor um, and an act of accepting on the part of the other individual. And in this particular instance, and I'm not a theologian and nor am I a philosopher, but um, you know, we, we were always told when I was a kid in Sunday school that when ultimately you're judged in life, you are judged for individual acts 
but also for the aggregation of all of the things you've done over the course of your life. And that would argue that an act which happened 35 years before, which was a harmful act, if not acknowledged in a way that enabled the other party to then consciously forgive that the uh, person who should be seeking atonement or forgiveness uh, cannot then be absolved of that act. And that in fact, the act continues on. And we, you know, we're gonna deal with some of this in next week's class around things like the statute of limitations just looking at the law, but the statute of limitations that ought to be applied when one has been abused as a child and can only confront directly what, what happened 30 years later. And so I think that in this instance, unless there is some act of contrition, on the part of the accused here, that the individual has to be held accountable until there's an acknowledgement that they have done wrong. So, people are often surprised that of the, the lack of a set framework for what constitutes a Supreme Court justice, or any justice. But sometimes, in, in some states, you actually don't even have to have a law degree. Uh, and to the extent that it is possible that our own lives, that our own outlook things that we would do, things that we have done, mistakes that we've made, things we've done on purpose, things that we, that we haven't been repenting for matters, then it strikes me as, as, as in this context, relevant. We, we are, people bring a, everything that they are to being a Supreme Court justice. Now maybe there are certain things that, that, that don't matter. That some people like, peanut butter and banana sandwiches or something. That's that's not this. Um, so I think that um, I think that it's relevant and I think that it matters and I think that the process for for people to have faith in this institution, one that has been endowed with so much power um, that it is it is worthwhile that we do our absolute best to get a clearer picture as the people that we are endowing with that power. Thank you for this truly remarkable uh, panel that you put together. When you talk about the power that they have, and they do have tremendous power, and the media has but you, above your, your term, the informed media, uh, you have the coexistence of a profit motive media, which dumbs it down. Fast news cycle, if it bleeds, it leads, no death. And you have a public set of eyes that isn't following death. But let's say you could get death from the media out to the public to educate them about the power that's on the Supreme Court or any of the federal courts. What mechanisms could you imagine could be used to change who's on that court without actually packing the court with more members? Can you think of a way to remove them and change them? There's one way that I know of for sure, if you're unhappy with the direction of the Supreme Court, uh, to change is on the Supreme Court. And, and really only one sort of 
tried and true way, that is to vote. Uh, other than that, it strikes me as uh, an incredibly fraught process to try to change this any other way. Uh, now, we, we could, if we wanted to, we could change the rules about the Supreme Court. We could have it be 20 members. And in a certain sense, maybe that makes sense, 21 members. We could, we could say it's not a lifetime appointment, it's a, it's a four-year tenure, and you rotate off, and we got to have fresh blood. And, and, and maybe that's a good conversation to have. But even that conversation doesn't have happen unless, unless we vote. Yeah, and I would, I would also say this is something that I think Republicans have understood at a more uh, profoundly political level than Democrats have, which is that when the Federalist Society, which developed its farm team of uh, judicial nominees that are coming to the fore now, first gathered in the mid-1980s at Yale University, um, they decided they were going to identify conservative law students, put them into clerkships, kind of groom them, um, so there would be this, uh, this uh, pool of, um, of people to be uh, selected. And evangelicals, as we saw with Trump, were prepared to put aside objections to all sorts of morality and comments and things like that because the court was so important to them. I mean, I think what he's right, which is that clearly if you could go back to whatever were the Democratic constituency groups, suburban college educated women, uh, African Americans, um, Latinos, and said, this is a preview of what the court's going to do, then they might have voted differently, they might have turned out in, in better numbers. I guess I don't see what's going on with the court a crisis in democracy. I see it as one side being more effective in mobilizing uh, than the other side. I think the Democrats now, and I think this will be one of the challenges going forward. Let's say Kavanaugh doesn't get up, um, doesn't get approved. Let's say things get delayed to the next term. Let's say the Democrats win the Senate. I think they'll be under enormous pressure to pull a two-year miracle where they're not going to approve anyone until the next president. And then the Republicans will then do the same thing. And that's where we start to enter territory where you know, it's like that Monty Python uh, skit where they keep on chopping off the, the hands and the legs and the arms of the knights as they're fighting each other. That's where you get a deadlock and a polarization that really needs to cripple the country. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I, I wonder if that could be in the offer. And I do wonder one other thing about voting um, in, in this instance, and that is. Um, if a hearing takes place prior to the midterm elections and it's televised in the same way that uh, other similar hearings of this type um, have been televised, it does strike me that the uh, demeanor and the uh, performance of the members of the Judiciary Committee in terms of how they um, raise questions with either of the parties could have an effect on the midterm elections. Uh, there's a senator in Texas, for example, who sits on this committee, um, who is up for re-election, who's not always known for having been calm under <laughs> certain types of uh, questioning. Um, and I, I think back to two other hearings that inevitably uh, come up around um, uh, this particular hearing. Um, Joe Biden, uh, in the Anita Hill hearings, performed in a way that gave him a much longer political career. Um, Joe McCarthy uh, did not. And there were also staff who were part of those hearings. Uh, in the case of um, uh, the, the McCarthy hearings, it was both um, Cohen and Bobby Kennedy who emerged. And in the case of uh, the uh, Anita Hill hearings, there were other staffers who emerge as uh, political leaders. So the performance of the questioners 
if this hearing is held before the midterm, could affect some close races. Enough to change the makeup of either of, of the uh, of parts of the legislature. Um, and if I can think of that, and I think the people who are involved have thought of that. Uh, which, which leads me to believe that there is a calculus about the timing and the nature of the choreography of these hearings that one, at least one side, probably both, are assessing at this moment uh, in terms of what the effect will be on elections that will be happening uh, really only weeks from now. I'm running ahead to talk, and basically, is uh, put on about uh, three miles. <laughs> um, Professor, I was interested about your comment about um, don't, I don't know anything about machine learning, but you plug in data, you want a diverse set of data so that you get better outcomes. And this isn't a novel question, but it's more about your opinion on it, given that analogy. Um, you talk about diverse data screen for it's not very. On gender, I think we talked about mostly on sex and gender and um, and uh, uh, race. But everyone is educated at the same schools pretty much. You know, Harvard, Harvard Law, or Yale Law. Uh, so when you go to Northeastern Law, you're not going to make on the Supreme Court. What do you? What? Uh, it's not offensive, but I mean, not meant to be offensive, but like to be like war, George Shumler, what have you. Sure. So what do you think? What impact does that have on the Supreme Court? So it's certainly, if you look at the trends, is if you ever want to be a Supreme Court justice, statistically, you must graduate from Harvard, Stanford, Yale, maybe Columbia, or you know, an incredibly small handful of other schools. Um, I think that that um, is unfortunate. I think that it, it deprives people um, uh, of, uh, if, if indeed, that is driven uh, solely from a, a sort of prestige, point of prestige, right? In other words, oh, how could someone from Georgetown possibly sit on the Supreme Court? Um, I mean, it's incredibly unfortunate. I think that, that people are being denied uh, a wealth of experience and opportunity uh, that, that could inform incredible opinions. Um, I don't think that only people that graduate from those schools are capable of producing a good opinion or handling the complex sorts of, of challenges that come from, uh, that, that, that come in front of the Supreme Court. Um, anyone that, of course, is on the Supreme Court should have a good legal mind, a strong legal acumen, but you can get that um, at a lot of different places. And, and so I, I, I think that it's, it's a shame. Um, and I think that uh, it would be um, uh, given the right candidates, a ph a phenomenal to, to, to break up a little bit of that just strong homogeneity with, with respect to it's, it's hard for San Francisco with us. Right? And, and, and to, to break that up would, would really um, provide an, an interesting piece of diversity, along with a lot of the other needed diversity that is already needed on the courts beyond um, you know, race and gender lines, just to, just to start with. Well, I want to thank you both for it's really been a really terrific evening. And, uh, and I think if the hearings, if they take place, reach this level of insight and uh, thoughtfulness, then we'll be in good shape of the country. Thanks very much. Thank you.